transition stimulates the creative juices of people on the streets to get together beyond their differences to make best use of their their resources, their energies, their spirits. It's not about trying to change behaviour. It's about setting in place structures which can be available when needed. When there's the perceived need for them, they're there. For me, transition is moving towards an economy where everyone has a value, everyone has a place, and everyone has a purpose. And that includes the environment having a purpose, but also people. For me, as transition is more engaging with your community, building your community, and uh, helping your community. Everybody cares about their community, so everybody has something to offer, and I love that inclusivity about it. So to me, that's what transition is about. So transition for me is imagining what our community looks like 20, 30, 50 years into the future, where we've done a really good job of creating something that's inclusive, that is thriving, where people are happy and our way of living is sustainable and then figuring out today what we can do to help us get there. Humans have been going, oh, what's, what's this stuff? Oil. We've just found it. Oh, this can be quite useful. And so they've started using it more. And then Oh, this is really useful, so they started using it even more. And we're increasing the levels that we use oil. And meanwhile, the levels of oil left are rapidly decreasing. And so that is causing a big problem. All the greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, that are, that are released when we're burning it, go up into the air. It captures the heat from the sun, keeps it in, stops it from getting back out, bounces it back in, boom, 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 and it will actually heat up the earth, which will cause unstable weather, there's a general rising in temperature, the poles will start to melt, so the sea levels will rise, flood land, and it will generally cause climate chaos. Peak oil is also linked to another problem called economic crisis. Now, economic crisis is when the economy goes bust. So basically, for the economy to grow, first of all, you need consumers. Then you need stuff for the consumers to buy. The stuff is produced in factories, and the factories need cheap energy, such as oil. And when they don't get so much of that cheap energy, because of peak oil, the stuff becomes more expensive, so less consumers buy it, and the, co the economy shrinks. But what transition people would want is for us to have a sustainable economy instead of one that grows and shrinks like anything, because the economy that we have now, um, it could go boom at any moment and just disappear. But if we have a sustainable economy, it won't. So we all need to transition in some way or another, but we need a guide. Our culture is so strongly set up for us to be consumers and to be unaware of what's going on in the world that to, to make those changes, you need support. And so transition, the community, supports us. A forma como se está como se está a levar a, a nossa sociedade hoje em dia não é sustentável. Portanto, é, surge como alternativa a, a, a todo este comportamento consumista e cada vez mais insustentável que estamos a ter. It's the way to create a world of people that are more connected, they're more connected with themselves and each other and the natural world around them. Everybody can feel they have something to offer and contribute and it isn't something for experts out there somewhere to do. And it really feels like it's given me a, a momentum and a real kind of sense of purpose in my life. And because it's a lot of fun. It's so rewarding, so nourishing to get to know people really, really well and talk about real things. I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy, you know, helping people. I enjoy building my community. Mm -hmm.
Transition starts with a group of people coming together and that group of people can come from a range of different places. They might be a group that's already been meeting as something else, might be a group of people who already know each other but don't work formally together. Uh, it might be a group of people who meet at an event or in the pub and say, why don't we start transition? Uh, but that initial coming together of people, that forming the group is, is, is the seed for the whole process. The first event was on the 3rd of April. Eight people showed up. Eight people showed up to that first event. And then the second event, one person showed up. And I remember coming home and my husband commiserating with me for the low turnout. And I, I looked at him and he said, you're wrong. You know, all the people who came were the right people. And we have the saying in transition that whoever comes is the right person. And I was very skeptical about that. I, oh yeah, sure. And I must say it's true. It, totally turned out to be true. Of those eight people who came to the first event, four of them are now part of Transition Wayland, of the initiating group. And that one person who showed up, he's part of Transition Wayland initiating group as well. Now the last event at the, uh, at the library, there were maybe ten of us. Uh, most, of, uh, most of us was Transition Wayland. We talked uh, into the night the librarian had to kick us out of the library because we just went over. And uh, I walked out of there knowing that that was my last my own uh, event that I had planned and uh, I was walking on clouds um, because I knew we had a group. What we've observed from looking at what transition groups are doing as part of this five-year experiment we've been doing uh, is that they go through a number of stages. The first stage we call starting out, which is that creative, playful, storming sort of stage where you're running around, showing films, putting up posters, organising events, doing awareness, raising stuff, uh, starting to lay the foundations for what will become the transition initiative. But at that stage, you might not even call it transition wherever. <laughs> Moss Side is very, very in a city area. It's very densely populated. Um, it's very multicultural, and it's had the, you know this this horrific reputation as being you know the Bronx of Britain. And because it's so densely populated, you can go along a whole row of houses, uh, knocking at quite a speed. Like as soon as someone's not in, you can move on. I used to work for, I worked for a double glazing company, knocking on doors doing that. I worked for an energy company as well. That kind of built up my confidence in door knocking. And I just thought, well, I know I can knock on people's doors and be persuasive and make a good impression. So I believe in transition so much more than I believe in those other things. So that increased my confidence as well and made me think, actually, I could probably do a really good job of door knocking for transition as well. And I think you get a very different response through the door knocking than you probably do through any, any other type of awareness raising. As a numbers game, you know, the majority of people, I guess, probably don't sign up and it's just a case of keeping, keeping going. And then what's the best way of getting in touch with you? I'm always in, I'm in every day. You're always in? Yeah. Okay, great, so just make a note, so it's 15. Every day. One of our core group members, Ali Mohammed, through our, who I met through door knocking, um, who had not, as far as I know, been involved in any kind of environmental work before. When I when I first saw Joe, obviously, um, I, I I wasn't that much of thinking what he's doing is great, but I was open to him and I was listening to him what he's saying because I thought like this person, especially when he said Mossad, I thought like this is this is something about our community, and so I, I started listening from that time. The door knocking seemed to me like a really kind of 
um, exciting way of just engaging new people who've who've not been involved at all in any kind of environmental activity before. Good to know your neighbors as well, because if something happened to you, your neighbor could help you. And one of the door knocking as well, then we build up this relationship with our community. And if we build this relationship, then that means that our community is well uh, protected and people know each other and they can help each other. There's no right way to do transition. Sometimes you'll start your core group, and then one of the first things that a core group will do is to start an awareness raising program. So it'll do flyers and posters and show films and so on. The other way around often is that just a handful of people, or maybe even one person, will start an awareness raising program, go out, show films, network with other organizations, do all that sort of thing. And then from that program of, of awareness raising, the core group will emerge. And neither is the right way. It's really about what feels most appropriate in your place. A terra onde vivemos pertence aos nossos netos. Temos de viver do que ela nos dá, sem estragar e sem depender de outras regiões. A aldeia das Amoreiras é a nossa terra e temos de a gerir sustentavelmente. O primeiro passo é sonhar. Qual é que é o seu sonho para a aldeia? Qual é a sua aldeia de sonho? Ok? Eu não gostei que vai ser ninguém. Os velhos têm morrido. Os novos vão mudar a vida para o outro lado. E cada dia está, está aí com a medida de velhos e pronto. Tenho ideia de boa conversa. A gente todos uns com os outros, que é o que tínhamos falta conviver bem uns com os outros todos e a solhar, se isso que a gente pudesse. O meu sonho, sabe o que é que era? Era uma casa aí para um médico, que não, uma logo na posse lá acima. Era o meu sonho. Algumas coisas mais para as crianças, tipo algum ah, jardim, mesmo para crianças, um parque. Ah, já quer dizer. <risos> Comércio é assim, para coisa, para, para as pessoas poderem se receber e fazer grandes deslocamentos, ir a Ourique, ir ali. Então, ter comércio, ter mais comércio na Ter um bocadinho de comércio na aldeia. Que bonito! Era muito bom que fossem apenas alguns dos pontos a serem realizados, dos sonhos das pessoas, era muito bom porque a aldeia precisava mesmo disso para ficar mais dinâmica e sustentar-se a si própria, que era o que no fundo ela precisava. Having a vision of the future becomes like throwing a magnet or a whirlpool in front of you that over time starts to draw you in that direction. There's a real power to doing that, I think. If our vision is that we have communities that are thriving, where people feel included, where people have a sense of well-being. We need the basics of our living systems to be working for that. But actually the biggest journey, I think, and the biggest transition that we need to make is, is actually on the inside. So to understand how to create well-being in people, because it's not through having masses of stuff. Actually, we need a culture that supports people into a state of well-being something about what goes on inside us both that we're aware of and just to start to feel into what also happens that we're not so aware of and how much those things that are happening inside us shape the way that we are with each other um, shape what we do in the world so a way of looking into how does how does a human being work on the inside
that the way that we've made the world that has this focus on competition, on getting as much as you can, on keeping up with the people that have more than you, you know, and, and, and seeing, often seeing the other person or the person who's different as somebody who's a threat, that comes actually out of a state of consciousness and something that's happening inside us. And until we can feel that and own that and look at what's happening and work with it in some way, that will keep on expressing itself in the world. The second stage we call deepening, which is where you realize all of a sudden, hey, we are now transitioning wherever it is, and we're becoming an organization, and we're having to make things a bit more structured and a bit more formal, uh, and it's, it feels very different from that initial starting out phase. It feels like you are becoming uh, an organization. I was looking for a place to blog. Whenever I found Transition, it seemed like they were basically working with all of the, the tools that I was trying to implement. It seemed like you know there was a lot of knowledge there, and I really wanted to tap into the, the knowledge resources. I noticed that there was permaculture stuff on there, which was something that I was interested in, something that I wanted to start to integrate into urban areas. Transition was like a culmination of everything that I was interested in in the one website. It's kind of tough to find other people like that. You know, I used to not think that there was anybody that was really interested in gardening, you know, my age. And uh, Transition Pittsburgh and, you know, that website and everything associated with it has kind of showed me that there are people out there that, you know, are gardening, which was kind of considered a girly hobby in the past, to where now, you know, I can listen to heavy metal, dress like a punk, and still garden and be cool. We're in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Pittsburgh. It's a blighted area by any means. Well, first thing we do in the morning is we like to go and check the abandoned houses to make sure that there's no squatters in them so it's at least safe for us to operate. We're gonna do the yellow house. 20% of the lots here are boarded up or vacant lots. Hello? Hello, anybody home? good news is there's nobody in here. This is Whitney Avenue Urban Farm. There were houses here about, I think five, six years ago before they burnt down. Everything that we grow here is pretty much given away for free or donated to the food bank. People from the neighborhood also know that they're welcome to come here and pick fruits and vegetables whenever they feel like it. Well, Chris and Carly came on Whitney Avenue. It was a street mainly of vacant houses and old dead lots and they beautified this whole street single-handedly. It started people appreciating what they eat. Some people on the street was hungry and they could go up to that garden and pick something to eat. We work with the kids in the neighborhood to do this. Um, Basically, you know, we had a whole bunch of kids that got in a whole lot of trouble and we needed a way to keep them occupied and keep them busy and this turned out to be our way. When I first started going, I said, that's lame. It still is kind of, but it keeps me out of trouble. We had other kids on the street that was giving Brandon a bad influence. He was following other kids that was a bad influence on him. And then so once the kids moved away, and then Chris and Carly gave him projects to do. He turned out to be a nice little kid. When you start picking the food from the garden, what do you do with it? Like the corn? All of it. Oh, we sold it. Oh yeah, where'd you sell it? Right over there. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Wanna take me there? Yeah. Yeah, let's go. We wait for the people to come down there then we ask them do they want to buy some tomatoes or some zucchini or corn. And if they say no, we say thank you, have a nice day. We love the kid. He's like, he's like a son to me, you know? I want to teach him everything that he's not getting at home. What happened here in Wilkinsburg, one of the main things that the, 
that the downfall has been attributed to was the loss of fathers, basically. A lot of kids that are here have either their fathers are in jail, they were murdered at some point, or they've just disappeared altogether. There were gangs here, and whenever the FBI came in and disassembled the gangs, dismantled the gangs, then, you know, that meant they hauled off and threw in jail for 20 years, sometimes 60, 70 people at a clip, all men, most of them fathers. My goal over time would be to establish more of these types of gardens around Wilkinsburg so that people can feed themselves. This is a model, what I'm doing here, of what could be done in really every street in Wilkinsburg has at least one lot that's had a house torn down in it. You know, it's, it's ridiculously simple. And I'd like to see every, every little neighborhood in Wilkinsburg should have a little garden. In a way, I guess I am showing them sustainability, but they were not. I don't even think most of the people on the street could have told you what sustainability was two years ago. It's changed the block to where everybody else in Wilkinsburg envy our little street. Everybody wants to come to Whitney Avenue, but it's the best street in Wilkinsburg. I'm crying, you got me crying. <laughs> it makes me feel proud for, uh, to myself because when my family come around, I feel proud of where I live at. And that's changed me. In terms of practical projects, food is where a lot of transition groups get started first because you, can, you don't have to wait for anything to get on with that. You don't need permission to do it. You don't need funding to do it. If you want to set up a windmill on the edge of your town, that could take you five or six years. You can start a garden share scheme. You can start growing food. You can start window boxes. You can start that really, really quickly and really simply. So what we see time and time again is it's local food projects are the first things transition initiatives do and the first thing that they start to gain some momentum around. We're at Kilburn Station on the Jubilee Line and four months ago these beds were empty and that's what gave us the idea of asking the tube could we plant something here and we specifically wanted fruit and vegetables to show people how easy it is to grow fruit and vegetables anywhere. We believe this is the only tube platform in London that's got fruit and vegetables growing on it and even an apple tree. Part of the reason that we've got this plot in such a high profile place with 12,000 people coming through the station every day, we're delighted with the idea that a commuter can get off the train and pick a strawberry or a tomato and punch it on the way home. It's fantastic. We went to uh, Transport for London and uh, asked if we could grow some food here. And I think at first their reaction was um, a little bit nervous. We don't want to grow food there, but we're quite happy for you to plant flowers. So our first attempt at it was a little bit disheartening. Uh, so when we went to have a meeting with them, they introduced the idea of the Underground in Bloom and they said, well, we'd love for you to do this as part of our Underground in Bloom competition. And when we went through the list of categories to see which one we may want to enter, they seemed to be genuinely surprised that there was a grow your own food category. So we pointed it out to them and said, well, we'd love to take part in that. We have an apple tree and we have some uh, veg seeds that they weren't even aware that you know, we, they were allowed to grow food on their platforms. It pays to be persistent because sometimes, you know, like with a lot of things, it depends on personalities that are involved and somebody might, they might not really be willing to take a risk, but some people just get really excited about it. So depends on which person you speak to at, an, at any organisation. A different way of seeing the place that you see, like I've been living here for 10 years, so to see it in a totally different light, this is the first time that I've ever done something that's made these connections in this area for me. And that's quite, a, that's quite an exciting thing. It's really important when we do transition that we design in some space to celebrate. You know, there's that cycle of dreaming and planning and then doing something and then remembering to celebrate what you've done before you go back into that, into that cycle again.
celebrating appreciations, all of that positive, positive communication really helps us as human beings just to feel resourced and, and good about ourselves. That where we create space to celebrate each other's achievements, to appreciate the qualities that we see in each other, people build trust and they enjoy being together. Whereas if we're in a constant state of pressure and uh, we don't have time for that because we're moving on to the next thing, actually that's just a recipe for people to be exhausted very quickly. In every meeting there should be some celebration and appreciation of, of what's happened, um, as well as having events where you very consciously celebrate the things that you've done. It would be really deceptive if this film gave the impression that transition always works and is always glitteringly, dazzlingly successful. Sometimes individual projects or different initiatives or the entire organisation will fall to bits uh, acrimoniously or just maybe they run out of steam. We can have a rosy vision that if we all have the same dream, we'll, we'll all get on, and it's not going to be true. Difference and conflict is always going to come into our groups. If I'm absolutely honest, it was horrible. I, I won't go into the full details of it, because some of it's quite private, but uh, it had an absolutely horrible ending to it. I was very scarred by some of the things that had been said, and very, very upset some of the abuse that had been hurled around. And quite upset at myself that um, I think by the end of it, I was... I was pretty equally willing to get quite engaged in being not very nice. Gosh, if this is... If this is the people that are try coming together trying to save the world, get me off this planet. I don't want to be here. Because um, we ain't got a hope. And maybe we, can, we are probably all completely misguided and naive and a bit stupid. And if we can get through it and be open to learning, it's transformational. You know, it can really help us the next time to do it better. I think what was learnt, what became learnt, was when a new group did arise, we realised that the most important thing, beyond saving the planet or beyond uh, whatever, peak oil, was that people really focused on being able to hear each other and have respect for each other's view, not necessarily agree with it and be able to say we don't agree, but to tolerate and consider uh, relations between people is the primary thing. I think one of the things that inner transition kind of points to and one of the ways it can really help people is by providing support structures, um, providing spaces where people talk about just how it is to be carrying responsibility in this work of transition. <laughs> Because we're not in the transition town incorporated, there's no line manager sort of giving you a pat on the back. So for people who are running things, I think it's good to have peer support, other people that are like yourself who can you know, hear what you've been up to and who understand the problems that you're facing. It's very tiring being at the front of what you're doing or feeling that you're at the front of what you're doing. And you can, you can forget why you're doing it um, but there's something about going back to the emotional pool, the emotional source that, that, that reminds you why you're doing it and puts you back in touch with, with that, that drive in a very good way, you know, and you, you, you feel happy about it again, you know, rather than on a treadmill. I think it's absolutely fundamental. I think transition calls for everybody to step into a different level of leadership. Um, the leaders of different projects can get together, support each other, um, network with each other, um, and maybe even learn some skills they can take back to their own groups. 
there's something a bit magical about it. And it reconnects me to, to why I'm doing this in the first place. And now I feel like I've got a really strong support network. It's, it's turned into much more than what I thought it would be. The third stage is connecting, and that's where once you're up and running, you start to really reach out into the, into the wider community, to the organisations and the people you might not normally have come into contact with at that stage, the local council, local businesses, uh, the wider community. So connecting is really a stage which is about um, embedding the project much more deeply in the community and making it much more relevant to as many people as you can. Nell'estate del 2008 ho ottenuto il mio primo Transition Talk a Monteveglio. Ho invitato una trentina di persone che pensavo potessero essere interessate e quello che è successo dopo è che chi è intervenuto ha voluto approfondire. È stata uh, un'esperienza che ha visto, mi ha visto nella prima riunione rimanere veramente scioccato rispetto a quelle che erano eh, le informazioni che, eh, che ci venivano date. Diversi mesi più tardi eravamo tutti molto più consapevoli di quando avevamo cominciato. Qualcuno di noi ha pensato di proseguire il percorso all'interno del gruppo guida di Monteveglio Città di Transizione. E altri, come Umberto e Daniele, hanno pensato di candidarsi alle elezioni per il Consiglio Comunale. Hanno vinto e adesso sono il sindaco e l'assessore all'ambiente. Il risultato è che ci siamo ritrovati con un consiglio al cui interno c'erano due persone molto molto consapevoli eh, rispetto a tutte le tematiche della transizione e anche gli altri avevano un'idea piuttosto chiara delle sfide che avremmo dovuto affrontare negli anni successivi. Cioè come fa un amministratore di una città di 5.000 abitanti a eh, prendere atto della crisi del modello di sviluppo crescita limitata, della fine dell'economia del petrolio e a eh, come dire, indirizzare delle politiche? Il primo atto è stato quello di scriverlo nero su bianco. E così nasce una delibera ufficiale in cui l'amministrazione indica come politica prioritaria la fuoriuscita dall'economia dei combustibili fossili, prevedendo la stesura di un piano di decrescita energetica. Spesso ci chiedono come abbiamo fatto a costringere i nostri politici a firmare una delibera così impegnativa. La cosa bella è che non c'è stato bisogno di convincere nessuno, non abbiamo dovuto fare nessun tipo di pressione. Uh, noi abbiamo già, fatto, abbiamo già ottenuto risultati molto importanti a mio modo di vedere, uno tra tutti è quello di una decisa uh, diciamo, inversione di rotta relativamente a tutto il tema urbanistico. Lavorare fianco a fianco con l'amministrazione permette ovviamente di fare cose che se no sarebbero impossibili, un esempio è il progetto Enescom, un progetto europeo che porterà i sei comuni della vallata all'adesione al patto dei sindaci e che ci consentirà di scrivere i piani di decrescita energetica per tutto questo territorio. Se poi queste politiche si fanno avendo dietro dei ragionamenti come quelli che ha fatto il comune di Monteveglio sull'aumento di resilienza e sulla fuoriuscita da un'economia eh, basata sul petrolio, l'adesione la dell'intero territorio al patto dei sindaci diventa ancora più interessante. Il patto dei sindaci è un programma europeo che mira alla riduzione delle emissioni di CO2 e allo sviluppo di energie più sostenibili e rinnovabili. È un buono strumento per la transizione perché consente di tenere assieme le persone e gli amministratori nello stesso processo. Quindi a Monteveglio vediamo succedere quello che già accade in tante altre città di transizione. In più c'è questo forte coinvolgimento del livello istituzionale che speriamo possa portarci a cambiare la realtà delle cose un po' più in fretta. What's really fascinating is what it starts to look like when that bottom-up approach that is transition meets an engaged, proactive local authority who are also thinking in terms of uh, localization and resilience. And that interface where those two things meet is really, really important and fascinating area that's starting to emerge. How can a council best support the transition process rather than drive it? How can they embed uh, an awareness of peak oil and the need to build resilience into the work that they do and what do those two things look like when they when they come together
Transition Together was originally conceived here in Totnes through the Transition Town Totnes initiative as a way of engaging people in a street by street kind of a way. So a group usually starts by somebody coming into the office or ringing us up and saying they're, they're interested in starting up a group in their neighbourhood and they are the ones who then actually go and recruit all their neighbours. So that is something that's a bit different about our project. We don't go out and, and knock on people's doors, they're the one who does it. So they usually get together between about six and ten of their neighbours and they then go through seven sessions, so they have seven meetings together. The first one we facilitate, we send somebody along just to help them get off on the right track and to set a schedule of when they're going to be meeting again. And then the second session looks at energy use in the home, so there's about 10 to 12 practical actions that they can take, none of which cost much money at all, so we're really focusing on no cost or low cost actions for people. And then at the end of that first session, they write a little action plan and each person usually takes on two or three actions that they say they're going to do or try and do before they meet again. Lots of things we were able to put into practice about how to save energy and how to be better users of the resources that are on this planet, really, without suffering, actually without suffering. And that's the key. It was actually a fun thing to do. Because it looks at it on a street-by-street -street level, it means people can start to imagine the implications of that and start to think about what a post-oil, low-carbon world is going to look like on a small scale. It's not about how are we going to imagine the world totally changed, it's how can we imagine this bit of our bit of the world, how can we imagine that transformed and made over. And that feels much more digestible. By applying the things that we read about in the units, talked about, made a big difference. It's been more a sense of how we are in our lives rather than what we're doing. Being more aware, being more conscious of what we're doing with our lives in regard to energy and wasting it or not wasting it and doing our best. I think the long-term benefits of the, the group aspect in particular is really around the social cohesion. Because it's a bunch of people that I wouldn't normally particularly have any cause to have anything to do with. So it's, it's brought us together in, you know, we've got, we're such a mishmash of people. It's lovely, but, but we've all got this sort of thing, this thread in common, which, which keeps us as, as a group and keeps us meeting. It's really brought a, a great sense of community to the street. <laughs> see that creativity spark and people start looking at each other's gardens in different ways and looking at each other's rooftops as, 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 as having great potential and I think probably in the long run that's the change that will stick. It's what society needs, what, what we all need is to live in a safe world and I think this is a start for it. And the fourth stage is building, and building is about that step of starting to think strategically about the localization of the place that you live. It's the stage where you start setting up energy companies, setting up local currencies, setting up social enterprises. So it's where it moves from lots of ideas into making a very tangible uh, push at creating a new infrastructure locally. There's been the greengrocers here on this site for a long, long time. Yeah, I've been shopping here uh, at least 50 years. Certainly since the war, I think, it's been a, a greengrocery business here. The business was running down. It was looking increasingly like it was going to close. So we started talking to him about how we might take over and run the shop as a sort of, some sort of community business. The community-owned approach was a very deliberate move um, for ethical reasons, I suppose, and also very practical reasons. You know, we wanted people to use the shop. What better way to get them to use the shop than to give them ownership of the shop? The local folk side of things we didn't do before. 
which is which is what they're all about now. So people actually just come in with and I say I've got six cauliflowers. Do you want them? And as long as they're good quality, we'll have, we'll, we'll take it off them. Look at this. I know it's marvellous. <coughs> Local rhubarb. We love this. As I actually have customers that come into the shop specifically asking for giggle rhubarb. Yeah. It's part of the rhubarb triangle because we want to encourage people to grow more stuff. We want to develop that whole thing and, and uh, enable our community be, to become a bit more resilient. This is, this is the 1350 which we've got for selling our produce. And we recycle it back into the shop here. Yeah. And uh, I would expect we'll spend more. More, <laughs> which is the usual. So we've added a lot of value to the community. We've created jobs. We've enabled more people to do all their shopping locally. We've improved the business of other retailers around here by being here it's because more people are now choosing to shop locally rather than drive off to a supermarket or something. So they're spending more money in other shops as well as in here, which is great. I'm really pleased that it's been as successful as it has been. Yeah, it might not have been like this. It could have been very different, I'm sure. And right from the outset as well, we've done the, the bread, which is something really quite special. It was sort of a marriage made in heaven, really. The, uh, the two businesses, both cooperatives, because the bakery is a worker cooperative, where we're a, a, a consumer cooperative, I guess. I think things like a worker co-op structure means you're much more connected with the people you work with. You know, I've had colleagues all my working life, but it's not the same thing. This is a different level of interconnectedness. We started the bakery just over three years ago now. We managed to get together a group of about 60 families who paid up front for their bread, sometimes up to 12 months at a time. And the longer they subscribe for, the bigger the discount we offer them. There was such enthusiasm in the community that it was, we just knew we were onto a winner, basically. And then realised we'd run out of room in our little uh, 15 square metre cupboard. So thought we had to take the, the kind of the big plunge this time and, and look for our own premises. And still we didn't have any working capital to do it. So we had to think again about how we might finance this. It wasn't our idea, it was actually an Andrew Whitley suggestion um, and it had been bandied around um, other places about the idea of um, the concept of a bread bond. So a series of individual loans from our customers and people in our community on which we would pay interest to them. We pay them a good rate of interest, six and a quarter percent, but it was payable in bread, which equates to £2.50 a week, which equates to a loaf of bread a week. So you only get people that are committed to this place and this business, and it's actually a very cheap loan for us and a very good rate of return for them. They couldn't, you can't get a better rate of return on that kind of small investment anywhere on a, from a high street bank. You know, reconnecting with food is a, is a fantastic metaphor for reconnecting with everything else in your life. At the moment, every time we pay our energy bills, all that money just leaves our community. Its ability to make things happen, make transition happen, uh, is lost. And it's really exciting to see now the number of communities that are starting to set up their own energy companies in such a way that energy is generated, but, in, but it benefits the community, it brings money back in. We are the first community-owned solar power station in the country. Britain. That makes us feel pretty proud. The solar power station is a, is a rather grand term for a, a 98 kilowatt peak array. But we've calculated that it's, a, it's enough for about 40 houses, 40 homes at current consumption rates. We're not going to be able to power Lewis by means of solar panels, but there are all, all kinds of other ways that we can do it. It has the advantage of being easy, quick, cheap, instant and unproblematic in terms of planning. We uh, asked Harvey's, the brewery, if they would be willing to lease us their roof. Uh, they said, yes, in principle, fine, as long as we dot the I's and cross the T's on all the legal side. We had the launch uh, in the town. We'd advertised it very extensively. We'd been 
in the local press, making sure that everybody knew about it. The money started coming in. We started getting checks through the door with the application forms and in a very short space of time, I think it was three weeks, we had more than we needed to, to fund the installation. It's real community investment, so it gives something back to the community. People get it, it's very straightforward, and also the fact it's doing great things for the environment. It's, it's saving us on our carbon emissions, but it's locally owned. It's local people coming together and doing it. It's a very interesting precedent to set, because what it shows is that people power is actually the, the effective power in terms of community fundraising and uh, community projects. Such a good seed for lots of other potential community activities. You know, it, shows, it does demonstrate for the community to get together in, in areas that even 10 years ago they wouldn't have thought possible. If you have um, a renewable energy installation of any kind, you will get paid by the government for every unit of electricity you generate. We're accumulating from the feed-in tariff revenue a a lump sum out of which we can repay people's initial payments. It's been a very difficult process for us. I'm a composer. I'm not a businessman. I'm not a financial any, anything. I've had to learn an enormous amount in a very short space of time, and we all have. Nobody should go into this with any kind of illusions about the amount of effort, the amount of commitment, and the amount of time that it takes to do it, it is difficult. Resilient communities are the future. That's where we're headed. So it's all about having the structures in place locally to be able to supply the needs of the community. The models that we're pioneering are models that can eventually be adopted in some form by people in other communities and other parts of the world. You can think of the economy of the place that you live as being like a big bucket and into that bucket go pensions, wages, grants and so on. But at the moment things like supermarkets, paying our electricity bills, internet shopping are all drilling holes into that bucket that means that our accumulated wealth and its potential are just draining away. And everywhere that there's a leak in that bucket is a potential local livelihood, potential local business, or training opportunity for, for young people. So things like supporting community energy companies, supporting local food where it's available and boosting that where it isn't, and using local currencies are all very skillful ways of plugging the leaks in that bucket. Brixton is the most diverse cultural place in the UK. There is, it's unique. We have every single nation under the sun. We started the Brixton Pan, it launched in 2009. Now we've reached a number of about 200 businesses taking it officially. Tonight, with it going electronic, we are the first area in the whole of the United Kingdom to have e-currency. Is that not what we're We're now advancing into a digital age with, uh, with a pound. I just think it's, uh, it's another wonderful, um, wonderful incentive for people to come down to Brixton Market and come to Brixton in general and uh, give it a thing and spend their money. Absolutely. Thank you. The New Economics Foundation, uh, a Dutch organisation called COIN and Transition Network have been developing the software to, to actually launch this kind of electronic currency. Um, but it's, Br uh, Brixton is the first pilot where it's actually been tested in practice. Oh, hello there. How's it going? Oh, not too bad. So I just wanted to take a quick look at my watch. I, I have it for in, you. Um, yeah, just have a quick look at it. See if it's. Um, right, I'll just get just the uh, special <laughs> watch sticks right. until now. <laughs> and um, right, no problem. Let's have a look and see what we've got here. Right, well, I reckon that's going to be a new battery in that oh, one. Oh, okay. How's that? Lovely. There you go, and it's working. Lovely. So £2.50. £2.50, right. Can I pay by text? Is you certainly right? may. Absolutely. So, just go to the Brixton Bank. And your 
Stuart, Stuart the, the Watchman. Watchman. So it's S T W. You got on? Yeah, got the message. Nicely. Lovely. All right then. Yeah, got me message. Job done. Lovely. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, there Thanks, you go. See you next time. See ya. Bye bye. See ya. What we've developed, which is a pay by tech system, can be used by anyone with no hardware at all. I mean, you don't need a swipe card machine. All you need is a mobile phone. And it doesn't need to be a smartphone, it's just a very simple, basic mobile phone to send a text, and that's all you need. Can I pay by text? Yeah, you can. Cool. So, what's your um, username? It's uh, Sana Foods. Yes, yeah, Sana Foods. Our local independent businesses are absolutely crucial to resolving the economic problems that we've got at the moment because small and medium-sized businesses are the lifeblood of the British economy. And the thing about the Brixton Pound is, the whole ethos of it is, is about us spending our money locally and turbocharging our local businesses so they thrive and prosper. The importance of the Brixton Pound isn't about shifting money from, say, North London to South London. It's about creating a different type of economy. So one where we're actually asking questions like, can we supply things locally? Are there people that live locally that could fulfil this role? And can we do things a bit differently? It's about actually having a sort of economy where everybody can have a role, can have a job, and where we can have a really thriving, diverse, type of strong local economy. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Three pounds to Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Great. Have a good day. See you again. Bye. And there you go. The Brixton Pound. Electronic. Fantastic. Transition initially was designed really as a detox for the West, as a way for the more affluent West to reduce its emissions to meet the developing world coming up the other way. But it's been fascinating over the last year or so to see it start to emerge now in the developing world. We started with our first village, which is Kotakarai, where we live. So our first goal is to, for the village, our homes, the families, to have access to nutritional food. That's the core of our uh, program and our project, is everybody should have access to good quality food. We go to one house, uh, we say, do you want to have, start a vegetable garden? We bring the seeds and we show you how to maintain it. Mm. And as soon as we start, uh, then the neighbors will come and say, okay, can we also have the same? And that's how we have been growing okay. with this concept. Okay. It, it can bring very positive results working in the rural India. For example, if you if you say this this is the size of a carbon footprint of a person living in US, okay? This is the size of a carbon footprint a person living in India and this is the size of a carbon footprint of a person living in a rural India. So we don't have to come from all the way down to here, we're already here. We just have to adopt models where most of our practices are green practices, are renewable practices, and still keep the villages, the rural India, in rural India, so it will stop migration. We are bringing the transition from uh, an old model of traditional village to a developed uh, India, and find a balance where they don't feel they're left out not living in the cities. We're very happy to, to see smile on the faces of villagers. Like, mm. uh, they are very welcoming us to mm. open their heart and their house. From when we started doing transition, we always had the idea that 
that it would be great if, if it was something that was able to sufficiently get into the culture, into the DNA and the bloodstream of a place, so that when it encounters times of great uncertainty or difficulty, that transition is one of the things on the table that people pick up and use to design their, their response. So it's been really interesting over the last year or so to see places where things have got really, really difficult and where transition has become uh, almost a, an instinctive central part of that community's response. Even before the disaster, I thought like, transition is the most wonderful thing I can do in my life. After the disaster, it made me so even more obvious that transition is just what we have to do. I have to do. The power of 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 the だいたい80名から90名ぐらいそもそもは311の地震と原発事故をきっかけにしてあの立ち上がって今の電気の在り方はどうなのかこれからの電気の在り方はどうなのかということを考えるようなそういう趣旨で集まってきたんだと思うんですが今までいろいろと考えて話し合いもしてたんですけどなかなか実際の行動には。落とし込めてなかったようなところでああいう災難があってでそこで誰かがあの呼びかけたんですね「富士の電力」っていうキーワードで僕たちにも何かできることがあるんじゃないかその「富士の電力」っていうキーワードで一気に立ち上がった。光祭りというイベントがをきっかけにして一気にこう具体的なステップに踏み出していった今年第8回目で、ね、今年についてはあの全部自然エネルギーでその祭りの電気を賄おうという趣旨で進んだんですね。大体延べ人数3日間で 5,000 人ぐらい。来場していただきましたけどそういった規模のイベントを全て自然エネルギーでやったとでその後はあのその光祭りのメンバーとあと参加してくれたアーティストのみんな可能な人だけだったですけど東北の方にあの祭りを届けに行こうということでそのようなところで電源供給をしてきました。それとは別にやっぱりこの自分たちの住む地域地元をこの全て自然エネルギーで賄っていきたいでそのためにじゃあこの富士野にはどんなエネルギーの可能性があるかなざっと浮かぶところではまずこの森ですねでそれに合わせて小水力山々はあの深く谷を作っていて水の流れは強い場所がいくつかこの地域にあるのでこれからそういう段取りが必要だよねというところを富士の電力の中で共有してでもっと地域に広げてまた共有してそれで進めていくようなイメージを持っています。Littleton, New Zealand, the town where I used to live, was recently struck by a major earthquake. Going back there was heartbreaking. Much of the town had been destroyed. Yet, amidst all this loss, was revealed the true heart of the community, the goodness and the kindness of its people.
I was the Littleton Time Bank coordinator uh, and I'd been working as the coordinator for the past few years building and connecting community. Time Bank was bought here as a complementary currency. People managing to find another way to live without constantly needing money. And at the same time, it's this amazing community strengthening tool because people could trade in skills, get to know each other, meet their neighbours. Then we had this awful earthquake in September 2010. Civil Defence had been called through to Christchurch as it was deemed there wasn't any actual need here in Littleton. However, there was a need but of a different kind and the emergency services as in the fire brigade phoned us and said, we know that you're involved with the community, we don't know what you can do but what can you do, can you help? So we set up base in our office and we were very, very busy and frantic for many weeks helping meet community needs um, such as delivering water and food and helping out with emergency repairs. One thing to hold true. We'd kind of just got on top of things just two weeks before the February earthquake hit and it was, it was different this time. It was um, faster, it was worse, all buildings were down, um, it was entirely different. It was like September was a practice run. We pulled together as a community, we found out what needed to be done, how we could get it through this um, database of Time Bank volunteers. At that time there was just over 400. We just got things in motion and sent out these emails. This is where we are, this is what we need. And people came in droves and then they sent those emails out to their own databases and on Facebook pages and we had so many volunteers coming in. It was absolutely incredible. I don't think the community would have pulled itself together as quickly as it did without the um, community time bank here. This goes out to everyone who lost anything but found each other. Because the true heart of a community is its people.
watch our love, our dreams unfold We can make what we want of this world Let's make it beautiful I want to make it beautiful with 